All right. Welcome to Politics After Dark with Rachel. I am your host, Rachel. Yay! I have, yay! I have with me noted. Uh, are you a PhD or just a master's economist? I'm just anyway, a master. Um, he he's a PhD to me, economist. She <laughs> Kevin Rollins. You can call me doctor. Okay, we'll call you doctor. Um, Kevin Rollins joining us here, and um, the wonderful Norman Singleton is uh, working out some technical problems, as per usual. Uh, <laughs> not that it's a, a per usual thing with Norm, just that technical difficulties happen. It's not a, it's not a thing. We'll just work it out. Um, but first things first, we have to go over what everybody's drinking. I will start. I have my little Rand... Wine glass. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to cry in it. <laughs> Rachel, I think you might be dr drinking alone tonight, which is really sad. I, well, I, I'm drinking with you. That means I'm not alone. So uh, I'm going to imagine um, a, uh, a glass of whiskey here in front of me. So. Oh, okay. Um, and then this is a Cabernet Merlot blend from Chile. And I am of the opinion that even though Chile produced Pinochet, they have never produced a bad wine. So. Cheers. And am I to understand, Kevin, that you are not drinking anything? I, I've given it up. No, not really. I just, I don't have any in the house, and I didn't run to the store, so. Okay. Well. You can just uh, collect your tears of libertarian heartbreak in a receptacle of your choosing and toast with that. <laughs> You're getting pure sober commentary from me today. It's going to be a level higher, I'm sure. So Pure sober commentary. That's against show policy, but okay. I'll take it, since you are a doctor. More drinking, less thinking. <laughs> Cheers to that. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Norm, can you hear me now? He is unresponsive. <laughs> <laughs> Usually he's full of smart ass remarks, so that is to to be concluded that he cannot hear us, but he's working it out. Last time he worked it out and everything was okay. Just, you know, the, the beginning part of the show, I will just talk to Kevin for a while. Um, so, Kevin, Rand dropped out. I don't know if you've heard yet, but Rand dropped out. It, was the, the, it was the end of all of our lives. Yeah. It's, it, is there There's any no point reason. of going on? No, not really. Um, I was really kind of shocked uh, about how surprised some people seem to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the uh, RAND, the Stand for RAND uh, network on Facebook, at least, a lot of people were sp sharing the message that you know the polls are really wrong, and that RAND had internal numbers that were going to be so huge, and it just seems uh, it seems sort of uh, unbelievable. Um, I mean, it was great a great idea that it would be true, but um, unfortunately, it's not, and um, I don't think we should have been all that surprised leading up to this, and uh, so it's it wasn't that big of a letdown for me. It's sad to see, you know, not have that voice in the race now. It it is very sad, and actually, um, I I hate to be a negative Nancy here, but he actually lasted longer than I thought he was. Once he started going back down into single digits instead of the other way, his momentum was just going the opposite direction of where it needed to be. Absolutely. Um, well, I remember in December thinking I was almost about to say something publicly. Sort of suggesting to Rand that you know it's time to get out say, sooner than later, save your energy, go back to Kentucky, save your seat. But yeah. you know, who, you know, who wants to be negative? You know, who wants to say throw throw water on the uh, party? Yeah, it's it's like you you feel uh, disloyal or something to suggest such a thing. But um, I mean, the, the important thing is to keep him in the Senate so he can keep on standing and filibustering and then gear up for 2020. Right. Which would be a great year for an eye doctor. Think of all the slogans. <laughs> 2020. His vision is 2020. I mean, come on. I do like that. 
<laughs> um, and and it, it's it's possible. Certainly, uh, you know, we might get Bernie. Um, and who knows what will happen if uh, Jim Webb and Michael Bloomberg get into the race? Um, but I mean, I don't think libertarians should be so terribly upset about you know the presidency. I mean, obviously there are you know, issues that affect us, and it would better to have more libertarian person than less. But it's not likely that we're going to have the majority of a major party um, anytime soon, and we have to accept that. Yeah, and here's the thing: is we're electing a president in a, you know, a, a republic, a representative republic. It's not like we're electing a dictator, which is good news now. You know, um, it's, it's good news even if Rand was in the running to, you, you know, I even though Rand is awesome, even though Ron Paul is awesome, I wouldn't want them to be a dictator, and that's sort of what we should take comfort in right now I think is even if Bernie Sanders gets in which I think is probably the polar opposite of what libertarians and conservative uh, spenders want even if you know he's his power is still in theory limited as we saw with Barack Obama I keep pointing out you know you remember how the world just swung on its axis and everything changed the minute Barack Obama got into office. You remember how everything changed between Bush and Obama? Right. No? Well, that I mean, didn't I think happen? It, 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 there's a, one thing that people don't give Barack Obama and all these other people who are in the presidency credit for is that they mostly do not, I mean, you know, certainly they, they expand the government powers and they say there are less limitations made than there were previously, but they don't throw out the whole idea that there is an accountability that the Congress has power, the Constitution remains. Now, this is where Donald Trump, I think, is, is frightening to libertarians because he's actually out there saying, I can do what I want, and I'm, I'm the boy in charge. So I'm the guy in charge. I'm the big man. I'm smart. I got all the smart people working for me, and uh, you know, we're just going to get it done. And I think that mentality could be very dangerous, and I think if, insofar yeah. as the public supports that, uh, we could end up losing our Constitution completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if people got right down and thought about it, that kind of rhetoric, they're supporting a dictator. Yeah, and I don't and, see Bernie Sanders um, being, you know, using that kind of rhetoric. Now, he's certainly using a lot of populist, uh, uh, you know, uh, excitement about, um, you know, we're going to solve all your problems and the government's going to do all this stuff for you now. But I don't think he ever said that we're just going to do it regardless of what the Congress says. Um, and certainly I think if the Republican Congress can stay there, we will not get Bernie Sanders' utopia. No, because we didn't get uh, Obama-topia. You no, know? you're right. Cer certainly, I, I guess he's he's been able to tinker around the edges and you know get a Nobel Peace Prize for stopping all the wars. What? <laughs> he didn't even do that? No. Uh, so I, I, I guess the good news and the bad news is things are not going to change all that much no matter who gets into office, as you can see from the last administrations, you know. Um, you know, and, that's, and Obama that's the good news and the bad news. Obama opening relations with Cuba is a good thing. Yes, um, that's, that's, that's a good thing. And I, I think in the end, he, what he's done in the war on drugs has, has been, you know, a baby step in the right direction. At, at the very end, I mean, it wasn't going that way, you know, when he was a first term or because he wanted a second term. And now, while he's sort of, you know, in the end stages, I, I think things are sort of getting better, aren't they? I, I, I think that Obama, um, I don't know, I, I, it's, it's a mixed bag. I think Obama could do more on criminal justice reform, for instance. Um, I, I, I don't think that he's been the most radical spender. Um, I don't think, I think, again, I think he gets, deserves credit for those things. I think he's, you know, in terms of, compared to, say, Nancy Pelosi, in terms of his views and his yeah. demeanor, he's, he's not bad. Um, well, it, it has been in the news lately that our national debt is now $19 trillion, which when Obama took office it was $10 trillion, so he's nearly doubled it so far. So, I, I don't know. Is he is he not a big spender, or is that just spending that was already just going to happen? It, well, it's I, it. well, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, yeah, it, it's interesting to see the growth rate. I mean, it was it was on its course. Um, I don't think it's grown. I don't think it's doubled in, in his his period, but I, I could be wrong about that. Um, I mean, it's been it went from uh, one and a half trillion to three trillion, and and it maybe maybe the dollars are cheaper, so we might as well go for it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, who knows? It's it's hard to compare 
what what would have happened with somebody else, you know, when the policies don't seem to materially change from administration to an administration, and that's because the permanent government in Washington largely stays the same. Yeah, and, and, and of course, um, they, they generate these programs over uh, multiple years, and uh, people, as, as the programs get developed, people, these interests uh, solidify, and uh, they become then, you know, as, as, soon as, as soon as we started doing something, it's an essential program, and you can't get rid of it since we've been, you know, we, we started it last year, and now we've got to do it forever. Um, but, uh, I mean, in truth, though, there are, you know, programs where people do, you know, certainly uh, the, the welfare programs, people do tend to come to rely on these things. Uh, it, the, the problem with ethanol in Iowa, um, people are relying on the government subsidies to bolster their business, basically. Um, um, sorry, I'm chatting with Norm to see if I can help him with his technical problems. So, um, you you just give a sermon for a minute. Just you know, lay it all out there. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. Well, I'm, I know. I, I, I my my view is that. Hello? Um, oh, know, there's I'm, Norm. Oh. Uh, hold on, I want to memorize the settings I have. So. Yes. Take take right. a moment because you'll be back. You Got to chant right. them to yourself. Hi. Hi, Norm. So what's going Yay. on in, in the world? I, I've been busy. I was busy. I was impressed with the Super Bowl. <laughs> I have a sound effects machine just for you, Norm. Guess what else it does? Oh no. Does Does Jeffrey Tucker approve of that type of thing? On not <laughs> very sophisticated. Uh, <laughs> Lowbrow humor. Channel? Yes. It's how you survive in politics is the fart machine. <laughs> Can I tell the story? Can I tell the story? You might as well. I might as well because, you know. At some point. This, this is how, see, okay, let me introduce Norm as the, you sat in the desk next to me in Ron Paul's office. I was the press secretary. You were the legislative director. And we would be forced to watch the, um, television, the, the, the internal house television of, of the floor, you know, the house floor and all the speeches and pontificating that was going on all day long. And the only way to survive that as a libertarian is lowbrow humor. So you know, Norm had a fart machine, and every time someone said something really, really stupid. <laughs> which was often, yes, which was often. So, yeah. Yeah, Who but spoke often and often said stupid things. Yeah, but th this is like a really cool sound effects machine. It's got, you know, it's got applause and it's got Yeah, there's that. There's that. And there's Anyway, okay, I'll put my toy away. Um, <laughs> welcome Norm. But um Tuesday when watching the uh, debates. What was that? Are the primary results that's the woman screaming. Oh. <laughs> when yeah. you saw that Sanders had, had won. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could hear Hillary. No, she didn't care. She, she doesn't care. She's got all the delegates she needs so far. She's doing fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, democracy is a heck of a thing. Are you drinking coffee again, Norm? What are you drinking? I am. I am drinking coffee. coffee. I have no alcohol here. I have, I think that's I have sad. fireball whiskey, but I took it home for the snowstorm. Hmm. See, yeah, if you guys hired Paul Martin, you could have beer tastings. <laughs> and, uh, no, my, I think that um, despite the obvious disappointment of the election race, if you look kind of below that there's a lot of good news for the liberty movement we have a um, good. we just had a vote on audit the fed which is you know rachel because you were there during the entire audit the fed movement when ron oh, was yeah. congressman that went from an obscure issue to the senate majority leader actually all the senate leadership uh, sponsoring it uh... three popular presidential candidates uh... ran Senator Cruz, who missed the vote because he was campaigning, um, 
that's the and right. Sanders. No. Sanders. Sanders. Rubio voted for it. Um, and Lindsey Graham, who I don't know if people remember this, but he ran for president. <laughs> if, You'd rather forget. If you didn't watch the opening, the, the Kitty debate, you might have forgotten it. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll keep Senator Paul, hopefully, in the Senate. That's very, as you said, that's very important. Yes. Uh, we have other congressmen. We have groups like Campaign for Liberty, forums like Liberty Me, the Ron Paul Liber Liberty Report. We have... Yeah. Um, all we have Thomas Massey. We have Justin Amash. Right. Um, hopefully, and there are guys who are like 80 percenters um, coming our way. And the other thing to remember, too, is um, one of the things I, I see a lot of friends on Facebook complain about candidates um, saying, like, they're pandering to the liberty movement or they're, pan they're pretending to be a libertarian because they think it'll help them politically. Um, or, or they only voted for Audit the Fed because they knew it was popular. Well, yes. the real nature of politics actually is that... It's just are, exactly that. You, you want to be in a position where... You need to be pandered to. ...pandering to you and are, and are uh, promising things. And the la as you know, being up there, Rachel, the, the less... You don't necessarily want to worry about if they're sincere or not, and you don't no. want to worry about educating them. Educate yourself, educate your friends, educate your family, educate the people, and, and then, then get them to that, call and email like crazy. <laughs> right. When you do that, they will pressure the politicians. The politicians will follow. I was at a meeting today, yeah. and somebody said, um, "Politician said, well, politicians aren't thinkers." They're not thinkers, most of them. There are exceptions, Ron Paul being the, uh, the obvious one. Um, some of them don't think good thoughts, but there are exceptions. <laughs> but for the most part, they're not thinkers, they're not intellectuals. And even their staff, who maybe they are thinkers and intellectuals, but their staff are const have institutional constraints on them. And their staff also have career considerations, Yeah. which is K Street and moving up on Capitol Hill. So so if the people so it's really up to the people controlling the political climate in which they operate. That's the key and we're making great great progress um, slowly but steadily on that. And when I say great progress, I mean that I'm not say I'm I I look at it in the perspective of where we were when I first went to work for Dr. Paul in 1997 to where we are today. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's night. It's night and day, and and we you know. I, I think about it in terms of the the network effects of, uh, you know, people talking to each other to get validation for what they ought to believe or what they could believe in terms of political context, and when you have a bunch of people surrounding you, or you have, you know, you have several multiple on your college campus or you're in the office, and multiple people are expressing libertarian positions. They're using the word libertarian. Uh, in that group of people, it becomes uh, th those those sort of ideas become really acceptable and desirable. And I think we've, we're hitting a point where so many people are that it is becoming a mainstream term. And we are everyone wants libertarians on their dance card. Yeah, eight, yeah. Eight, yeah. Eight years ago, ten years ago, um, libertarian was a you never heard the word on CNN. I think there was a there was a whole year where or a whole like three or four years for the only time libertarianism got mentioned was because some crazy libertarian girl in South Carolina did this calendar and because she did the calendar she got on O'Reilly at Crossfire. <laughs> I forget who she was but that was literally... I, I don't know. I don't know. I never heard of such a thing. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that it. Um, you know, we, it's we, true. We, it's true. So, um, you know, I... Yeah. Now, there's some, something to be said for selling liberty with your boobs. Right. <laughs> now, now there's something called the libertarian vote, apparently, that... Yeah, yeah, that needs to be pandered to. That that in itself is success. Thank you, Norm. You have made me feel better. <laughs> you, know, you know, real libertarians don't vote. Don't yeah, and that's the problem. Don't tell it's them a principal thing. What, we, we, we actually want them to think that we, that, <laughs> that we do so that they pander to us without us actually having to 
get out of bed early and go to the polls on election day. Well, this is my argument against third party runs, especially the Libertarian Party, uh, Austin Peterson at all, um, even though he's got great hair. Um, the uh, <laughs> it, it's it's when libertarians in the GOP or or independent voters they want to run off and say you know we're going to go off and do our own thing, forget the uh, participating in big politics. Now again, I don't understand if you don't want to vote for the presidency or don't even really want to be involved, but I think poo-pooing people who are doing this uh, or involved in uh, trying to move the mainstream politics to be more libertarian. Um, I think if, if you're speaking out against that as a libertarian, I think you're working against the your own interests, and I don't I don't understand these people. That, that, well, I, I'm I'm more involved with obviously as the head of a C4 uh, believer in grassroots in a grassroots activism model that the your real work actually begins the day after the election because sure. the idea that we just elect good people and then show up on the polls two years later. Um, is really flawed because first of all there there aren't enough good people to fill a legislature secondly uh, even good people as you see on Capitol Hill get, get corrupted and sometimes they get corrupted by their own um, by their but their own belief their own their own goodness corrupts them because they start to believe that I can do more the more power I have, and and the right. desire to be good can actually, um, kind of um, motivate someone to turn to 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 evil because they see the ring of power and they think, I'm a good person. I can, I, I want to wield it for good, or um, and and they end up there. So that's why you 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 really need to be on their case constantly. Uh, and on the the third party thing, I mean, I I I also do think though that um, I have friends who who Republican friends who make the argument that you know that the LP is not never going to actually achieve victory. That's not the path to victory, but it's a it's a tool because it gives a way to punish Republicans and Democrats who who go wander off the Liberty Ranch. Yeah, exactly. It holds them accountable. It's an accountability thing. Well, I, 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 I question whether or not it really does. <clears throat> I, I, the question is, my, my view is, if you know, can, can the Republican Party or can any major party count on Libertarians as part of its coalition? Now, granted, you know, if they put up Hitler, you know, they can't expect Libertarians to vote for that person. But you know, in terms of an ongoing proposition of if you're on the team or not, and I understand if people don't want to be, you know, uh, you know, a partisan player. Um, that's that can be an unpleasant game if you're if you're having to deal with people who, you know, some are are you know pretty anti-libertarian in some cases. But it seems to me that if you, again, there is there is something about identity, and you know, I'm not saying every, you know, I would say that you know, if you want to be in the major party politics, do it, but don't then say, oh, at every moment I'm going to jump back out. And if you're not, maybe work on education. Work on, you know, go, go, you know, help the, the Mises Institute or help Institute for Main Studies yeah. or, or any of the other organizations that Norm's involved with. Um, go campaign do that. for Liberty. Norm campaign is for the. Liberty. There you go. What's yeah. your position at Campaign for Liberty at this point, Norm? Pre president. Yay! Mr. President. Mr. President. I, we, we have president on the show. I sh that's how I should have built it. Okay. Um, so uh, Monday is my holiday. Oh, is it President's Day? Yep. Fantastic. Well, I'll celebrate Norm. Um, Scott Horton is actually here um, in the chat room, and he has a question. He's asking Norm, what went wrong with the Rand campaign? I don't know. Um. <laughs> Uh, Who do we blame? I, well, I, I, I will just let, let me just say this first. I, I don't know that there that anything went wrong with the campaign or with the voters. Maybe the voters just aren't there yet, and I don't know that any of it has to be the campaign's fault. So, with that being said, I, I will say this though, not not about any particular politician, but I've seen some commentary and um, for a while. And um, some of my my friends have been saying this that um, we need to be more um, 
establishment. We need to try to make nice with the the Rovians, and I, I think that's a that's a mistake. Um, I still, yeah, how's that going? <laughs> well, I, I still believe in the old Rothbardian um, notion that we should be populist. Um, we should bring together the all the victims of the state in a mass coalition, but the establishment, the political class, they're going to be the last people to take our views because we're asking them to do something that they don't want to do, which is give up power. And again, that's why the only the only way they'll ever do that is if they're presented with a choice, a stark choice where it's you either reduce the size of government, you either give up power or you're back uh, selling used cars in um, <laughs> uh, wherever. In Vermont. <laughs> used cars these days. Uh, Bernie Sanders has never done anything as productive as sell used, used cars from the latest reports. <laughs> um, hey, Rachel, can I respond to this uh, Charles yes. Cohen comment about the Libertarian Party of Alabama? Um, yeah, I, I'm so just said, reading this. It's a long comment. Um, so, so, so they pressured the city of Birmingham to reduce barriers to ride in the city. Well, that's, and that's wonderful. My question on that, though, is what is necessary in terms of an organization to facilitate that kind of activity. I mean, certainly you could have the Libertarian Action Network that's not a political party, not trying to do ballot access and such things and, and do things like that. So, I mean, unless the ballot component was necessary, I don't see that being a Libertarian Party, per se, uh, cause it. And it's wonderful that, that the group is out there doing that, and I think that Libertarian Party, you know, if, it's, if it is doing those things, it does have a reason to exist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you that's you, you can do that through campaign for liberty or, um, you know that's that's what we do and we actually a lot of our most notable uh, successes are at the state and federal or federal state and local level. Yeah. Um, and you but you could also do that you can do that um, through buy or tripartisan measures too because the great thing about you know our my group. Um, at campaignforliberty.org, shameless self-plug, is that um, <laughs> we are uh, open to, and we want members of all parties to be involved in our in our efforts because we're about pressuring them once they're elected. And I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or a Libertarian. If you vote for liberty, I like you. If you vote against liberty, I don't like you. <clears throat> Very good. I mean, that's just basic... Sung Tzu, the art of war, understand your enemy in order to win the battle. And, you know, the enemy is the politician standing in your way. And if you understand that their motivation is just job security, then you figure out how to inflict pain <laughs> or threaten their job. Or, you know, you give us the liberty that, that we are entitled to. So that's just, that's, yeah, that's the name of the game going forward is just to deal with reality and how things are rather than how they should be or how you wish they were. <laughs> and, and I think also making the case that, you know, these libertarian ideas are beneficial and beneficent to, to people. Um, yeah, that's it, part it, of the education effort is you, right. know, you, you have to do some good education and some good messaging in order to not, like, appear crazy to, to sort of baby step people over to your side, at least on... You know, issue by issue, perhaps, is how it needs to go, rather than full scale. But I was, I was going to extend that point and say, say that you know, when you're help, when you're trying to get local uh, or state legislators to to do something more libertarian, giving them ammo, helping them make the case, and including doing background research and really you know putting those ducks in a row for them, yeah. and saying you know here's the great case for it, and you could even give them the more moderate version of it. And say, you know, you know, you don't have to sell it on all the hardest points. You don't have to sell it on, you know, hardcore Rothbardianism. You know, you might be a hardcore Rothbardian, but you don't have to say, you know, you got to read the good book first and then go and use it against uh, your opponents <laughs> intellectually. You, you need to be able to figure out how to um, reach people on what they care about. And that was um, the great thing about what Ron did was he took – the pure libertarian message, pure Austrian economics, and he explained why you should care about this. Yeah, um, you know, absolutely. Why, why, you know, the Federal Reserve is not just an abstract thing that we want to get rid of because uh, Mises and Rothbard said it was bad. It's bad because Mises, because if you understand what Mises and Rothbard are saying, 
that the Federal Reserve is the root of why the, your grocery bill keeps going up and why your kids um, are, are not facing such a bright economic future as you had and why there's a problem with income inequality, crony capitalism, and all the rest of the, of yeah. the uh, problems we have with our corporatist economic structure. Well, it's, can it's, I, can it's, the ruin, it's the ruin of society in that your savings and investment are, 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 are taken away, basically. And yeah. then it's, it's a, it's a, it becomes a moral uh, impairment because people who are doing the uh, correct thing and are, 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 are disabled from getting ahead by doing so. Yep. That is a great transition to talk about the other thing that I wanted to touch on tonight, which is the Federal Reserve um, and the economy. The, the markets did crazy things today, um, which I don't know if you followed, Norm. I followed a little. I saw the headline on Drudge was about somewhere there were lines out the door for people to buy gold, which is, of course, a sign that um, people are starting to panic about the economy. Well, do you know why? It's because Janet Yellen um, opened her big fat mouth, which she's not supposed to do as the ch chairperson of the Federal Reserve. As we all know, the, the chairperson's job is to say as little as possible in as many words as possible. Am I right? That's well, what the Fed chair does. That, that's, what, that's what a lot of yeah. people in Washington, that's kind of what their, their job is. Yeah. <laughs> the job description of somebody in Washington. Why that type of thing was called Greenspan talk. Yes. Because yes. that's and why Greenspan was beloved by the political and financial class because that's what he did for his um, what 15, 20 years as Fed chairman, almost 20, he, I think. They would pour over all of these turns of phrases and they would, you know, Oh, what does it mean? What does it mean? But Janet Yellen just comes out today and says, "Oh, negative interest rates. That's certainly on the table. We just have to look into the legality of if we can do that or not." She but did. yeah. Yeah. What What was interesting about that is that um, though is that I, I I saw some interpretations as saying that it was she kind of seemed to blow off the question as if she was saying that well we're not really looking at negative interest rates, yet she also did sort of admit that it's a possibility. And I think that um, given that um, the... That, that's so much more than Greenspan or even Bernanke would have said. So, <laughs> Rachel, are you, are you an advocate for esoteric policy messaging where, uh, you know, the... Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a value in that in terms of you letting that the, the, the complexity of the messaging be something that's digested through the markets. I'm, not, I'm not saying what I'm in favor of. I'm just saying that the job of Federal Reserve Chair is not to plunge the markets into chaos because of stupid things that you just let fly out of your mouth. I mean, I, I'm not in favor of the central bank at all, and this is sort of wise because, you know, she says five words and the markets go insane. Well, maybe maybe it was so, intentional, though. You I mean, is, is Janet Yellen totally un unaware of... Uh, you know this history that that you know we're talking about. Apparently, or she wanted to do it. I think that's what you're saying. Is is that you know she she wanted chaos. I, I think that people. I think that the Fed chairman's remarks are closely watched, and she has to know that what she says is going to cause. Maybe she's trying to get an estimate of the panic. Yeah. That, yeah. Maybe it's a, a stress test. That yeah. tomorrow, then they'll come out with some statement saying, "Don't worry, we're not doing negative interest rates." Um. That that could be. I think that um, the one thing, though, that it it, it shows, and I, I hope that some of our fellow libertarians who aren't hardcore and the Fed types, um, who for some reason, and there's some very prestigious thinkers here uh, on this camp, um, including um, the late great Milton Friedman, that um, central Central planning doesn't work. We all admit that. So why would central planning of money, of something as fundamental as money, work? And that this is an this is a perfect example of why it's foolish to let you know this one person. Why should Alan Greenspan or Janet Yellen have all? Yeah. This? I, I remember Rothbard exactly. once wrote a piece for the Mises Institute where he said uh, he talked about the cult of the Fed chairman and how. This, this personality cult grew up around Paul Volcker 
and um, he said that uh, it seems to be happening around Greenspan, and it's 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 quite it's wondering why. He said it, the the personality cult around Volker always puzzled him. He said he thought maybe it was Volker, the way Volker always chomped on a big cigar when he was in public. He said, but Greenspan doesn't smoke, so how um, how could, uh, how could uh, so, Vol so, Volker so uses a cigar for his that, comedy you know? timing? Well, of course, Volker. Um, of course, Green. I'm sorry, Volker. Greenspan would have would have. Uh, it, it's odd that Greenspan uh, didn't smoke because um, remember he uh, his his brief flirtation with uh, libertarianism and Austrian economics in the 60s came courtesy of Ayn Rand. And of course, if you're a, a true objectivist, you are you smoke because the <laughs> fire tamed man's fingertips. <laughs> Only dollar sign cigarettes, though. <laughs> Wrapped in a hundred dollar bills. Exactly. Um, Crazy. Have you guys seen? I have to ask you this. I, I saw the the greatest movie ever made yesterday called The Big Short. Have you seen it? Yeah. I love no. it. It's it so under, It's any movie that has Selena Gomez in a cocktail dress at a blackjack table as part of an explanation of. Wall Street of of Wall Wall Street, uh, very complex financial um, terms, is truly the greatest movie ever, ever made. made. Right? Yes. It's like exactly what we need. We we need we need the markets and the housing bubble and economics explained just exactly like that. And there was a scene where what um, the the lady the the insanely hot blonde model in a bubble bath drinking champagne was explaining was it credit default swaps yes I think it was yes that's yeah. how America is yeah. educated and it had Brad Pitt and Steve Carell Kevin you haven't seen this you've got to see it like right I'll, away I'll put that on my schedule yeah I, I saw it. it it's still in theaters it's like a theater kind of thing it's not it's yeah. not like a documentary it's it's like a, a hybrid documentary and yeah. Film. It, it's, it's amazing. It, it's a true story. It's a true story. Actually, I put a little thing up about it at campaignforliberty.org. Uh, it's a true story about a bunch of kind of outcasts and eccentrics who um, noticed that the housing market in, I think, 04, maybe earlier, was unstable, was about to, and they shorted the housing market. They were laughed at, ridiculed. They had their some of their investors threatening to pull all their funds. They turned out to be right. The only thing I, the only two things that I think libertarians have been kind of critical about is one, they don't discuss the Austrian the theory of the business cycle. The word Federal Reserve isn't mentioned. And secondly, there's one scene where they say, um, "Well, why isn't anybody in D.C. does see this coming, or why?" And, and why is it anybody in D.C. talking about it? Well, well, there actually was a congressman from Texas talking about it at the time. Yeah. There's yeah. another movie that kind of touches on that called 99 Homes, which would make a good double feature with the big short because this deals with the effects after the, bu the bubble. After the bubble burst, it's about foreclosures in Florida and a guy whose house is foreclosed, and he ends up working for the guy who's um, – kicking people out of his homes for a living. And at one point, this guy, who's supposed to be portrayed as the villain, of course, but he says uh, but they do give him to a chance to explain and justify his actions. And he says, I, I would rather be putting people in houses. But what am I supposed to do when the Federal Reserve pumped up the housing market and, the go and Fannie and Freddie and the government said, give money to anyone who walks in the door, and then, it, and then another point, he says to the guy, "You feel his assistant. You feel sorry for these people. Go back three years and feel sorry for them when they took a mortgage out on their home that they should have no, that they should never have gotten to build an extension on their porch." Yeah. Right. These are just the consequences of, of formerly bad policy. And again, the policy continues to be bad because, if you, you know, again, not that these people were, you know, solely responsible for getting the bad mortgages. <laughs> But uh, you know, in some sense, uh, you know, people who have this wild belief that you know you can have no no savings and no income and qualify for a three hundred thousand dollar house, you know, it's it's not to, you know to, to to be hard on that person, but maybe you should have thought seen it coming. 
No Kevin, doubt. you must see this movie. Kevin, no you must see it immediately. It, I don't know if anybody saw um, at the Super Bowl one of the ads that I found incredibly interesting was it showed people applying for and getting home mortgages on their smartphones. And my thought was great because I remember in 03 and 04 and 05, TV was <laughs> what could go wrong with that? <laughs> well, I, people to get homes, and that worked out swell. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the same company. I saw uh, in a venture capital fund, uh, actually it's Peter Thiel's, not Peter Thiel's, uh, Paul Graham's uh, fund, they're funding a company, and maybe this is the one that's doing this. Um, basically, it's doing uh, machine learning on people's cell phone, it's the, the data that's in your phone. So the habits that the phone can t tell the company about who you are, that's what's being you can use to estimate um, your creditworthiness. Hmm. So maybe 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 the number of times you check your bank balance, maybe uh, the number of girlfriends it determines that you have, or the number of uh, children out of wedlock, or the number of times you curse. Who knows? That, that that's the uh, uh, <laughs> you can you can you can imagine the data that's in someone's phone that might paint a picture of them. It's kind of kind of fun to think about what might indicate uh, the kind of person they are. So we're coming up on time for the show, uh, but I need to do some housekeeping here um, momentarily, if you'll bear with me. Um, I need to tell you about some upcoming Liberty Me shows. There is a new Jeffrey Tucker show called Tucker and Clark with Joey Clark and Jeffrey Tucker. That's a nude show? And uh, Yeah, they're going to be naked. No, it's new. New, new, Kevin. Yeah. It's uh, called Being Earnest. They're going to be discussing um, a psalm um, that has inspired the likes of Oscar Wilde and uh, how it relates to politics. So it Tucker and Clark, a psalm, like a biblical thing. Oh, okay. um, so that's going to be Sunday at 8. And um, Tatiana... Uh, Tatiana has a show, the Tatiana Show, and she's interviewing Jeff Berwick, who's kind of controversial, but he's very interesting and very cool. He's a narco capitalist. He has the, um, ooh, he's the Dollar Vigilante, so maybe you've heard of that. That's going to be next Tuesday at noon. If you want to come on Liberty Live for that. Um, and there is also Scotch and Scholars with Butler Schaefer, which is going to be really cool. That's also on Tuesday at 9.30. I'm going to put all of these links in the chat. And I also... What, what percentage of these podcasts involve drinking? Apparently it's a... Well, certainly Scotch and Scholars. Yeah. You know, I mean, most of them, all of them, if you like, you know, you, you watch from the comfort of your home. And what you do is your business. You just have to bring your own beer. It's BYOB because, you know, there ain't no such thing as a free beer, kids. You got to provide that crap yourself. So, <laughs> so and also, I'm wearing my uh, new swag uh, Liberty Me t-shirt, so I want to point that out. They were kind enough to send me this. So it's very attractive. Cool. This is my PJs now, very soft and all of that. So, those are my plugs. Anything you guys want to plug? Norm, plug Campaign for Liberty, and, and yeah. then Kevin, think of something to plug. Campaign.com, <laughs> we're working to, um, right now, continue to pass audit the Fed and um, internet sales taxes and uh, repeal the Patriot Act and maybe try to stop Obama from signing stupid executive orders taking away our guns. And our, the Lord's um, work, in other words. Yes. Yes. The Lord's yes. work. Kevin, what you got? Um, I'm not really working on anything particularly libertarian at the moment, doing a lot of software stuff. But I would say, uh, if you haven't been reading libertarianism.org lately, they've got just oh. awesome, awesome content. Libertarianism.org. Particularly, uh, Paul Mueller has a series on the libertarianism of Adam Smith, which I'm really enjoying reading. And I'll put in, in the chat campaign for liberty. I think it's campaignforliberty.com, isn't it? Did I say org? I should know. Is it, is it .com or .org? .com. 
dot com. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me once Good again. Good to see you, Rachel. Thank it you. It was a Sorry. pleasure. Well, see you, Norm. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Bye -bye. everybody. Bye -bye. Kisses and capitalism. <laughs>